Hello and welcome back. Before we talk about today's book, I do want to mention that there is a content warning in the description box below, so please check that out before you proceed with the video. So if you're a human that's been abducted by aliens in some kind of intergalactic human market, one of the first things you may consider doing is escaping or at least fighting your captors. And if you are familiar with the original Ice Planet Barbarian series, you will remember that Georgie did this very thing against the original aliens that nabbed her. And if you were an unsuccessful with fighting against your captors, and let's say you were then purchased by another alien, even though this is all very highly illegal, you would probably object to said purchase and would want to do whatever the hell you could to get away from this skeezy, slimy, crusty low life before they put any of their hands on you. So naturally you would scream, you would claw, you would punch, and you would kick. And if you landed any of these blows, all the better for you. Unless you are Chloe and you have just been sold to the Tratarians because being an illegally purchased slave in an alien galaxy seems like it's the absolute worst thing she could possibly imagine. Until she was convicted of murdering nine very important ambassadors and was sent to a remote prison planet to serve a life sentence. And that's when she realizes that things can get infinitely worse. That is our setup for Prison Planet Barbarian, which canonically is the first book that takes place outside of the ice planet. And because of that, it does kind of suffer from first book syndrome. It's a little grittier in plot and definitely not as upbeat as the last two books that I reviewed. In my opinion, it is probably the heaviest or darkest book in the Rizdiverse series, but it's a very important standalone novel, so let's take a little bit closer look at this plot. The story opens with our girl Chloe being processed into the prison on the planet Haven, which is a labor camp for terraforming the planet, and she is being questioned by a pair of guards, one she describes as a cat man and the other as a snake ant. We'll talk about these species later, so just keep that in mind. But they are talking about how Chloe is human and that Earth is off limits because the human species is so primitive and they're not even sure she is sentient. But Chloe, of course, can understand them and their dumb questions because she does have a translator stapled to her ear. It is not the sophisticated chip implant like Millie had in Pretty Human, but an external attachment. Chloe suffers their humiliating questions and learns that the prison is co-ed, and the guards do not believe she is going to last long because of this. The guards also tell her that she was sent to this prison specifically because it is one of the worst. It is where governments send prisoners they want to disappear, kind of like the Chateau d'If in the Count of Monte Cristo. This is Chloe's punishment for killing the ambassadors. She, who is a college student, is about to be in Gen Pop with 10,000 other serial murderers, arsonists, and all the other worst of the worst baddies in the galaxy. The snake ant guard, whose name is Noku, takes Chloe to the women's dorm. But he does a little tour of the prison first. On this tour, he tells her that he is showing her off to his friends because she is going to be very popular. They go through the main male dorms first, and finally through max security, where the most violent prisoners are housed behind glass. There is an ominous scene where Noku shows his power over Chloe by forcing her to go up to the glass wall. When she does not completely comply with his demands, he threatens her by saying he has the authority to put her in these same cells with these prisoners and even shows her what looks like to be the remains of a prisoner in one of these cells. But as Chloe is standing in front of one of the glass enclosed cells, she sees blue skin, horns, dark hair and tattoos. This alien puts his three fingers up to the glass and gives her his best fanged smile. Everyone, meet Jatari, former soldier, pirate, assassin, and current prisoner of Haven. The moment Jutari sees Chloe, he gets that whole Masakan territorial thing happening and decides that she is destined to be his. He immediately makes it clear to all his other cellmates that he has laid claim to this woman. And this catches the attention of Dremigan, another prisoner that is described as a gray stick-like alien that is 
almost as dangerous as Jutari is. Dremigan lets Jutari know that he has a friend in the guards and he will see what he can find out about this newcomer. This will cost Jutari a favor owed to Dremigan, but Jutari doesn't really care about the price. Meanwhile, Noku finally takes Chloe to the female barracks, where she is introduced to the very small female population of Haven. Before leaving, Noku lets Chloe know that if she needs a protector, she can ask for him. And if you could see me right now, you would see me rolling my eyes into the back of my head. But not to worry. If there was any miscommunication on what that offer really means, Arita is here to clear it right up. Arita is a Draconi, at least one in the two-legged form of her species, and she offers to be Chloe's friend and show her the way of the prison, including which guards are the best to get favors from, because the currency in this prison is not honey buns. Wink, wink. So Chloe does manage to survive her first week in the prison with the help of Arita, and she's put on plumbing duty, which involves having to stick her hands down drain pipes in the restrooms and scooping out clogs. I know, it sounds completely fabulous. Arita is constantly telling Chloe to choose a guard to make friendly with so she can be on the right side of the bargaining table, but Chloe just keeps refusing. Then Irita tells Chloe that she has heard that another prisoner has been bribing guards asking about her, and that he is Misaken and seven feet tall, in max security for killing three men during a riot, and that his name is Jatari. But Chloe isn't able to get any more information because Noku swaggers on in and takes her away to unclog another drain. I know, lucky her. So wouldn't you know it? The clogged drain just happens to be in the max security cell where Jatari is. Chloe quickly discovers the clog is from a uniform sleeve. And it just so happens that Jatari's uniform is missing a sleeve. Noku is big mad. He has put the pieces together. And while Jutari and the rest of the prisoners in the cell are being shocked into submission through their collars, Noku proclaims that he can do whatever he wants to Chloe. And then he proceeds to smack her across the face with a shock stick. Chloe is taken back to her dorm, and for two days, she does not see Noku. This seems like a good thing, until Arita comes to her and tells her that today is going to be a bad day. The snake ant guards are giving off a strange smell, and that means they've went into their monthly mating cycle. So when Noku appears, Arita tries to catch his interest, but he immediately goes for Chloe. He forces her to go with him, and I'm going to skip the details. Just know that Chloe refuses his advances, and because of it, she is beaten pretty badly, knocked unconscious, and thrown into max security. Luckily, she is thrown into a cell with Jutari. However, there are several other prisoners in that cell with them, and Jutari has to protect Chloe and make it look like he is doing exactly what Noku expected would happen, all right, so I hope everyone kept in mind when I said that this book was a lot darker than the last two I've talked about. Just buckle up. As Chloe starts to come to, she feels someone next to her and hears the person say, don't get up just yet, or we will have to put on a show. So Jatari quickly identifies himself and explains that he is not going to hurt her but he has to make it look like he is claiming her in front of everyone, both to make the other prisoners leave her alone and to satisfy Noku. He tells her to make it look believable, and if she has to cry to do it, and if she has to hate him, then she must. Everything is an act, and nothing truly happens, much to Chloe's relief, much to all of our relief. But the other prisoners decide to test Jatari, and this results in an epic fight between one naked Jatari and two other prisoners. They don't last long. Jatari continues to pretend to unwillingly claim Chloe, while reassuring her that he is going to keep her safe. But Jatari is not a fool. 
he knows that Noku is not going to leave her in the cell forever. This is when we hear about the plan. See, Jutari has a disc implanted on the inside of his cheek. It has a beacon in it that will send a message to his brother Kivian. Up until he met Chloe, Jatari really hadn't had a reason to try it to escape, but now he knows the time has come. As Jatari bides his time waiting to escape, he and Chloe talk more and he, they learn more about each other. They also have to continue to put on the, the whole show, but Chloe starts to kind of find out that she kind of likes when Jatari touches her. And at one point, the whole rubbing turns quite intense. Of course, our uh, good friend Dremigan has been paying very close attention to everything. And he has put the pieces together. And he's figured out that Jatari cares for Chloe. And he figures that Jatari is going to escape and wants in on the plan. Dremigan explains that he has connections within the guards and can get supplies for them and can help with this whole plan. Plus, he's calling in that favor owed. Jatari thinks on it and agrees. Jatari quickly fills Chloe in on the plan as well. The only problem is, in order to escape, they need to be put on terraforming duty to get outside, and that usually isn't allowed for max security prisoners. But Jatari has a surefire way to get put on terraforming duty, and if involves putting on a little show for Noku, which gets very real very quick between him and Chloe. But it does have the desired effect, and the whole cell is punished by being put on the most dangerous task. Escape day is here, and the plan is to cause a distraction by having a thresher machine break down. And while all the guards are busy with that calamity, Jatari, Chloe, and Dremigan will all run to the shock barrier. Oh, did I forget to mention the shock barrier? It's like a shock collar, but a field of it, and it surrounds the whole prison. And yeah, they're going to have to run through it, or Jatari is going to have to run through it while carrying the other two. As Jatari and Chloe are working in the fields, Arita, who is passing out water, makes her way over to Chloe and tells her that she has heard of the escape plan and that Dremigan is not to be trusted. Chloe immediately relays the warning to Jatari, but he says today has to be the day that they escape, and he is going to put his faith in Dremigan. Finally, there is a huge commotion, and one of the threshers is broken down with someone stuck under the blades. So Jatari grabs Chloe and throws her over his shoulder and begins to run towards the shock barrier. They meet up with Dremigan at a guard booth at the barrier. The guard hands over three bags of supplies, removes their shock collar, and gives Dremigan a knife that Dremigan immediately uses to kill him with. Tying up loose ends and all. So now Jatari throws Chloe over one shoulder and Dremigan over the other and just powers through the shock barrier. He barely makes it through, though. And both Chloe and Dremigan black out from the pain. Jatari is faced with the decision of whether he should continue with Chloe alone or should he take Dremigan with them? Or should he just kill Dremigan in cold blood? There is still quite a trek left to get far enough away safely to signal Kivian. And if you want to know how this all plays out, and if Dremigan really is a stand-up guy, you'll just have to read the book. So let's talk about how awesome this book is in showing the plethora of different alien races. From the moment Chloe arrives on Haven, she is describing the different life forms she is encountering. And from those descriptions, we truly start to see how vast the population of this universe really is. This book was published right before Barbarian's Rescue, which in the original Ice Planet Barbarian series was the introduction to the cast of characters that would later go on to make up part of the Ice Home tribe. And that is significant because they included the three new alien races. But this book sets the stage for that and actually provides the world building for the rest of the Ristiverse series, novels and novellas in a very clever way. By introducing so many alien races in one story in a very concentrated setting, Ruby Dixon allows the reader to take in a vast amount of information about different races disguised in a harrowing story. So when you read about these races again, they already seem somewhat familiar, and any additional information you get about them only adds to the already established mythos. 
The most obvious example of this is the sheer number of the different alien species described, but not necessarily named. As Chloe is walking through the prison on her tour, she is describing aliens that look like marshmallows, aliens with four legs and no arms, some with tentacles, and even like Dremigan's race is never actually named in the book, just described. Um, plus, we get some very detailed descriptions of a couple of alien races that are named, and they play a significant part in the book, even though they really don't appear as major characters again in the universe as of yet, like the Tratarians and the Sethari. The Tratarians are the tri-spawned aliens that Chloe kills um, to get sent to Haven, the the ambassadors that she was originally sold to that, you know, she killed at the very beginning of the book. And the Sethari are the race that Noku belongs to, that Chloe describes as the snake ant mix. So we know that right away in the first couple of chapters of this book, that the universe is made up of a lot of different races and species of alien life. Not just the original four that we were introduced in the original Ice Planet Barbarian series. But I think the most interesting and clever thing in this book that this book does is introduce some of some minor characters whose alien species do reoccur and play major roles in later books, particularly Erita, who's a Draconi. And if you're familiar with the Fireblood Dragon series, you know the significance of having a Draconi appear in this universe. Plus, later in it, later in like Ice Home and in the series, like it's major because it all ties together. But um, and then you have Lix, who is Luteri. I hope I'm saying that right. S some of these alien races are so hard to pronounce for me. Plus, if you didn't know, I do have a speech impediment. So some some of these alien races are so hard to pronounce, but Luteri or a caterpillar-looking alien. And although Lix does not make another appearance, the Luteri are mentioned several more times. The book, I think off the top of my head is when she purrs, but I'm also pretty sure that they appear in Steric as well. And speaking of when she purrs, the first guard that Chloe meets is described as a cat man. And to me, the only alien race that I can think of that are cat men are the Praxians. And the Praxians are definitely featured several times in many different books, but they are so centrally featured in when she purrs. And that brings me to my final point. This book may is this book not only set up the world building on how vastly diverse the population of the universe is, but it also set into motion how all future stories, with the exception of the alien's male order bride, would develop and grow from one another. While pretty human is the linchpin that holds the Riz diverse together. Prison Planet Barbarian is the seed from which all the Riz diverse stories propagate. Because if you take Aliens Mail Order Bride out of the mix, you can play Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon with any other book and come back to Chitari or Chloe with any of the characters from the Riz diverse novels. In fact, you can also do this with the original series, um, as well seen as how Chloe was caged with Kate, who ends up marrying Herrick. So... Jutari is brothers with Kivian, and Kivian is part of the crew in the Corsair series, who are linked to everyone in the Corsair Brother series, who are linked to the characters in Bad Guy and Worse Guy, plus individual characters from both the Corsair series are linked to the other characters in When She's Ready, When She Dances, When She's Bold, When She Purrs, When She Belongs, and there, of course, is a direct link to When She's Married. Plus, everyone is linked one way or another back to Varin and from Pretty Human. And I feel like I need one of those like diagrams with all the pictures and the red strings. But you get my point. Um, and like I said before, there's even a way that the Fireblood Dragon series is linked back to all of this. But it does take a, a lot of explanation. But it did start with Arita in Prison Planet Barbarian. And even though this book is a lot, and believe me, there are parts that are a lot, it 
it is not a happy go luck romance like Pretty Human is or the Aliens Mail Order Bride is. But I did like it. It is harder to read some of it. And please do take into consideration the content warning that I have given. And um, But I did give this three stars on Goodreads. And for me, it's uh, 1.5 on the steamy scale because it's really not that romantic at all. It is more of an action book. It is prison break, but make it sexy, just like the title suggests. <laughs> um, but I do think it is written very well. Uh, and I, but I like a book that can be a little more abrasive at times. Just use your best judgment and know that you can always skip parts and you can stop reading a book if you want. Plus, this is all fiction, but if it is triggering, then it is not for you and that is okay. It's always okay to say, this isn't for me. So please let me know if you have read this book. Um, let me know if you've read it. Did you like it? Did you enjoy it? And if you haven't read it, are you going to check it out? Up next, I really want to review the books that I gave four stars to, and that includes, I mean, can you guess it? When She Purrs, um, When She Dances, and When She's Bold. And after that, I kind of really want to look at a couple of different series just for fun that are outside of the Riz Diverse by a couple of different authors. These are series that um, may not be as well known. A uh, couple like Apocalyptic, couple fantasy, and then a couple other sci-fi series that uh, if you like sci-fi romance, they are going to be up your street as well. But let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you have made it this far, thank you so very much. Please consider leaving a like. And if you want to see more from me, you can always subscribe. Remember to take time for yourself. And until next time, love you. Bye.